I'm here today representing a team of artists and technologists and filmmakers uh, that work together on a remarkable film project for the last four years. Um, and along the way, they created a breakthrough in computer visualization. So I want to show you a clip of the film now. Hopefully it won't stutter. Um, and uh, if we did our jobs well, you won't know that we uh, were even involved. I don't know how it's possible, but you seem to have more higher. What if I told you that I wasn't getting older, but I was getting younger than everybody else? I, I was born with some form of disease. What kind of disease? I was born old. I'm sorry. No need to be. There's nothing wrong with old age. Are you sick? I heard Mama and Tizzy. And they said I was gonna die soon, but maybe not. You're different than anybody I've ever met. There were many changes. Some you could see, some you couldn't. Hair has started growing in all sorts of places, along with other things. I felt pretty good, considering. That was a clip from The Curious Case of Benjamin Button. Uh, many of you, uh, maybe you've seen it or you've heard of the story. Um, but what you might not know is that for nearly the first hour of the film, uh, the main character, Benjamin Button, who's played by Brad Pitt, is completely computer generated from the neck up. Now, there's no use of prosthetic makeup or photography of Brad superimposed over, the, over another actor's body. We've created a completely digital human head. So I'd like to start with a little bit of history on the project. This is based on an F. Scott Fitzgerald short story. Um, it's about a man who's born old and lives his life in reverse. Um, now this movie's floated around Hollywood for well over half a century. Uh, and we first got involved with the project in the early 90s with Ron Howard as the director. Uh, we took a lot of meetings and uh, we seriously considered it. And at the time we had to throw in the towel. Uh, it was deemed impossible. It was beyond the technology of the day to depict a man aging and back, uh, backwards. Uh, the, the human form and particularly the human head has been considered the holy grail of our industry. Um, the project came back to us about a decade later, and this time with a director named David Fincher. Now, Fincher is, is an interesting guy. Um, David is fearless of technology, and he is absolutely tenacious, and David won't take no. And David believed, like we do uh, in the visual effects industry, that anything is possible, as long as you have enough time, resources, and, of course, money. Um, and so David had a, an interesting take on the film, and he threw a challenge at us. He wanted the film to be, or the main character of the film, to be played from the cradle to the grave by one actor. It happened to be this guy. We went through a process of elimination and a process of discovery uh, with David, and we ruled out, of course, swapping actors. That was one idea that we would have different actors, and we would hand off from actor to actor, and we even ruled out the idea of using makeup. Uh, we we uh, realized that prosthetic makeup just wouldn't hold up. Um, particularly in close-up. And makeup is an additive process. You have to build the face up. And David wanted to carve deeply into Brad's face to bring the aging to this character. Uh, he needed to be a very sympathetic character. Um, so we decided to cast a series of little people that would play the different bodies of Benjamin at different increments of his life, and that we would, in fact, create a computer-generated version of Brad's head, aged to appear as Benjamin, and attach that to the body of the real actor. Sounded great. <laughs> Of course, this was the holy grail of our, our industry. And the fact that this guy is a global icon didn't help uh, either, because I'm sure if any of you ever stand in line at the grocery store, you know, we see his face constantly. So there really was no tolerable margin of error. There were two studios involved, uh, Warner Brothers and Paramount, and they both believed this would make an amazing film, of course, but it was a very high-risk proposition. There was lots of money and reputations at stake. And um, we believed that we had a very solid methodology that might work. Uh, but despite our verbal assurances, they wanted some proof. Um, and so in 2004, they commissioned us to do a, a screen test of Benjamin. And uh, we did it in about five weeks. Uh, but we used lots of cheats and shortcuts. We basically put something together to get through the meeting. And I'll roll that for you now. This was the first test for Benjamin Button. And in here you can see, it's a, that's a computer-generated head. Uh, it's pretty good, uh, attached to the body of another actor, um, and it worked. 
and it gave the studio great relief. After many years of starts and stops on this project and, and making that tough decision, uh, they finally uh, decided to greenlight the movie. And I can remember actually when I got the phone call to congratulate us that the, the movie was a go, I, I actually threw up. Uh, <laughs> um, you know, this is, this is tough stuff. Uh, so we, we started to have early team meetings, and, and uh, we got everybody together. And um, it was really more like therapy in the beginning, uh, convincing each other and reassuring each other that we could actually undertake this. We had to hold up an hour of a movie with a character. And it's not a special effects film. It has to be a man. Um, we, we really felt like we were uh, in a kind of like a 12-step program. And of course, you know, the first step is admit you've got a problem. <laughs> so. Um, and we had a big problem. We didn't know how we were going to do this. Um, and, uh, but we did know one thing. Being from the visual effects industry, we, with David, believed that we now had enough time, enough resources, and God, we hoped we had enough money. Um, and we had enough passion to will the processes and technology into existence. So when you're faced with something like that, of course, you've got to break it down. You take the big problem, you break it down into smaller pieces, and you can start to attack that. So we had three main areas that we had to focus on. We needed to make Brad look a lot older. We needed to age him 45 years or so. Um, and we also needed to make sure that um, we could take Brad's uh, idiosyncrasies, his little tics, the little subtleties that make him who he is, and have that translate through our process so that it appears in Benjamin on the screen. And we also needed to create um, a character that could hold up under really all conditions. Uh, he needed to be uh, able to walk in broad daylight at nighttime uh, under candlelight. He had to hold an extreme close-up. He had to deliver dialogue. He had to be able to run. He had to be able to sweat. He had to be able to take a bath, to cry. He even had to throw up. Not all at the same time, but he had to you know, do all of those, those things. And the work had to hold up for almost the first hour of the movie. We did about 325 shots. So we needed a system that would allow Benjamin to be able to do everything a human being can do. And we realized that there was a giant chasm between the state of the art of technology in about 2004 and where we needed it to be. So we focused on motion capture. Now, I'm sure many of you have seen motion capture. Um, and, and the state of the art at the time was something called marker-based motion capture. I'll show you an example here. It's basically the idea of you wear a leotard and they put some reflective markers on your body. And instead of using cameras, there's infrared sensors around a volume. And those infrared sensors track the uh, three-dimensional position of those markers in real time. And then animate can take the data of the motion of those markers and apply them to a computer-generated character. So you can see the uh, computer characters on the right are having the same complex motion as the, uh, as the dancers. So we also looked at numbers of other films at the time that were using facial marker tracking, and that's the idea of putting markers on the human face and doing the same process. And as you can see, it gives you a, a pretty crappy performance. Um, that, that's not terribly compelling. And what we realized was that what we needed was the information, what was going on between the markers. We needed the, the subtleties of the skin. We needed to see skin moving over muscle, over bone. We needed creases and dimples and wrinkles and all of those things. So our first big revelation was to completely abort and walk away from the technology of the day, the status quo, the state of the art. And so we aborted using motion capture. And we were now well out of our comfort zone and in uncharted territory. So, we were left with this idea that we ended up kind of calling uh, technology stew. We started to look out in other fields, and the idea was that we were going to find nuggets or gems of technology that perhaps come from other industries like medical imaging or the, the video game space, and, and reappropriate them. And uh, we had to create kind of a, a sauce, and the sauce was a, a code and software that we had written to allow these disparate pieces of technologies to come together and, and work as one. And so, initially, we came across some remarkable research done by a gentleman named Dr. Paul Ekman in the early 70s, and he uh, believed uh, that he could, in fact, catalog the human face, and he came up with his idea of facial action coding system. He believed that there were basically 70 basic poses or shapes of the human face, and that um, from those basic poses or shapes of the face, they can be combined to create infinite possibilities of everything the human face is capable of doing. And of course, um, these transcend age, race, culture, gender. And so this was, uh, became kind of the foundation of our research as we went forward. And then we came across some remarkable technology called contour. And here you can see a subject having phosphorescent makeup stippled on her face. And now what we're looking at is really uh, creating a surface capture as opposed to a marker capture. The subject stands in front of a computer array of cameras and those cameras can, frame by frame, reconstruct geometry of exactly what the subject's doing at the moment, right? So effectively, you get uh, 3D data in real time of the subject. And if you look in a comparison, on the left, 
uh, we, we see what volumetric data gives us, and on the right you see what markers give us. So clearly, we were in a substantially better place for this. But these were the early days of this technology, and it wasn't really proven yet. But you know, we measure uh, uh, complexity and, and fidelity of data in terms of polygonal count. And so um, on the left, we were seeing you know, 100,000 polygons. We could go up into the millions of polygons. It seemed to be uh, infinite. This is when we had our, our aha. This was the breakthrough. This was when, like, okay, we're going to be okay. This is actually going to work. And um, the aha was, what if we could take Brad Pitt and we could put Brad uh, in this device um, and use this contour process and we could stipple on the phosphorescent makeup and put him under the black lights and we could in fact scan him in real time performing Ekman's fax poses, right? So effectively we ended up with a 3D database of everything Brad Pitt's face is capable of doing. So. Um, <laughs> From there, we actually carved up those faces into smaller pieces and components of his face. So we ended up with literally thousands and thousands and thousands of shapes, a complete database of all possibilities that his face is capable of, of, uh, of doing. Now, that's great, except we had him at age 44. We need to put another 40 years on him at this point. We brought in Rick Baker. And Rick's one of the great makeup and special effects gurus of our industry. And, uh, and we also brought in a gentleman named Kazu Suji. And Kazu Suji is one of the great photoreal sculptors of our time. And we commissioned them to make a, uh, a maquette or a bust of, of Benjamin. And so in the spirit of the great unveiling, I had to do this. I had to, I had to unveil something. So this is Ben 80, right? Now, with, uh, uh, we, we created three of these. There's Ben 80, there's Ben 70, there's Ben 60. And this really became the, uh, the template of moving forward. Now, this was made from a life cast of Brad. So, in fact, um, anatomically, it is correct. The eyes, the jaw, the teeth, everything is in perfect alignment with what the real guy has. We had these maquettes scanned into the computer at, at very high resolution, an enormous polygonal count. Um, and so now we had uh, three age increments of Benjamin in the computer. But we needed to get um, a database of him doing more than that. So we went through this process then called retargeting. So this is Brad doing one of the Ekman fax poses, and here's the resulting data that comes from that, or the model that comes from that. And retargeting is the process of transposing that data onto another model. And because the life cast, or the bust, the maquette of Benjamin was made from Brad, we could transpose the data of Brad at 44 onto Brad at 87. So now we had a 3D database of everything Brad Pitt's face can do at age 87, in his 70s, and then in his 60s. Next we had to go into the shooting process. So while all that's going on, we're down in New Orleans and locations around the world, and we shot our body actors, and we shot them wearing blue hoods. So these are the gentlemen who played Benjamin. And the blue hoods helped us for two things. One, we could easily erase their heads. And we also put tracking markers on their heads. So in fact, we could recreate the camera motion and the lens optics from the set. But now we needed to get Brad's performance to drive our virtual Benjamin. And so we edited the footage that was shot on the location with the, the rest of the cast and the, uh, uh, the body actors. And um, about six months later, we brought Brad onto a soundstage in Los Angeles. And uh, he watched on the screen. And uh, his job then was to become Benjamin. And so we looped the scenes, he watched again and again, we encouraged him to improvise, and he took Benjamin in interesting, unusual places that we didn't think he was gonna go. We shot him a four HD camera so we could get multiple views of him. And then David would choose the take of Brad being Benjamin that he thought best matched the footage with the rest of the cast. And from there we went into a process called image analysis. And so here you can see again the chosen take, and we are seeing now that data being transposed onto Ben 87. And so what's interesting about this is we use something called image analysis, which is taking timings from different components of Benjamin's face. So we could choose, say, his left eyebrow, and the software would tell us that, well, in frame 14, the left eyebrow begins to move from here to here. It concludes moving in frame 32. And so we could choose numbers of uh, positions on the face to pull that data from. And then the sauce I talked about with our technology, Stu, that secret sauce, um, was effectively software that allowed us to match the performance footage of Brad in live action uh, with our, our database of aged Benjamin, the, the fact shapes that we had. And on a frame-by-frame -frame basis, we could actually reconstruct a 3D head that exactly matched the performance of Brad. So this was how the finished shot appeared in the film. And here you can see the body actor. And then this is what we called the dead head, no reference to Jerry Garcia. And uh, then here's the reconstructed performance now with the timings of the performance, and then again, the final shot. It was a long process. Um, so, thank you.
Um, the, the next, sec next section here, I'm going to just blast through this because we could do a, a whole TED talk on the next, you know, several slides. Um, we had to create a, a lighting system. So really, a, a big part of our process is creating a lighting environment for every single location that uh, Benjamin had to appear so that um, we could put Ben's head into any scene and it would exactly match the lighting that's on the other actors in the real world. We also had to create an eye system. Uh, we found the, the old adage, you know, the eyes of the window to the soul is absolutely true. So the goal here was to keep everybody looking in Ben's eyes. And if you could feel the warmth and feel the humanity and feel his intent coming through the eyes, then we would succeed. So we had one person focused on the eye system for almost two full years. We also had to create a mouth system. We worked from dental molds of Brad. We had to age the teeth over time. We also had to create a, an articulating tongue that allowed him to enunciate his words. So there's a whole system and software written to articulate the tongue. We had one person devoted to the tongue for about nine months. He was, uh, he was very popular. <laughs> skin displacement, another big deal. The skin had to be absolutely accurate. And he's also in an old age home. He's in a nursing home around other old people. So he had to look exactly the same as the others. So lots of work on skin deformation. You can see in some of these cases it works. In some cases it looks bad. This is a very, very, very early test in our process. So effectively we created a digital puppet that Brad Pitt could operate with his own face. There were no animators necessary to come in and interpret behavior. Um, or uh, enhance his performance. There was something we encountered, though, that we ended up kind of calling uh, the digital Botox effect. So as things kind of went through this process, it did kind of, um, uh, Fincher would always say, it sandblasts the edges off of the performance. And one thing that our, our, uh, our process and the technology uh, couldn't do is it couldn't understand intent, the intent of the actor. So it sees a smile as a smile. It doesn't res recognize an ironic smile or a, a happy smile or a frustrated smile. So it did take humans to kind of push it uh, one way or the other. Um, but uh, we ended up calling the entire process and all the technology emotion capture as opposed to just motion capture. So take, take another look. Well, I heard mom and Tizzy whisper and they said I was going to die soon, but maybe not. Well, I heard mom and Tizzy whisper and they said I was going to die soon, but maybe not. Well, I heard mom and Tizzy whisper and they said I was going to die soon, but maybe not. That's how to create a digital human in 18 minutes. <laughs> Uh, thank you. Uh, just a couple of uh, just quick factoids. It, it really took uh, 155 people over two years, um, and we didn't even talk about 60 hairstyles and an all-digital haircut. But uh, that is Benjamin. Thank you. Incredible.